When Tamara LaRue was 15 years old, she was a troubled teenager. And one day, she took a gun her mother had and put it against her chest, and she pulled the trigger. Her body was rushed to the hospital, but she said her soul went somewhere else. I was convinced that there was no way to live a completely happy life. And if I couldn't live happy, I didn't want to live at all. It began with a divorce, a broken home. And I believe that through that, my mentality began to form and began to develop a sense of rejection because I didn't understand. I was a small child and didn't understand adult things. And so I, I felt the breakup was all about me. That sense of rejection just really grew. I began to perceive myself as a burden to other people. And so I would take little bitty comments that were relatively insignificant. I would make it into a really big deal. Those little seeds in my life, I began meditating on over and over. And as I grew, the rejection began to grow. What is wrong with me? And so I believe that the only answer for me was to end my life. I walked um, to my mother's room thinking I don't want anyone to see me because I'm so determined to end my life, to end the void, to end the suffering, to end the loneliness that nothing was going to stop me. I began crying out and I began screaming out to God, God, forgive me. And the gun went off. Well, she's written in a book called Delivered. Tamara LaRue is here with us. Hey, it's good to see you. Thank you, Pat. It's a tremendous book. Thank you. That was a 38 police special. Yes. Your mother it had was. in her drawer. I understand a voice said to you, don't shoot your face. It did, Pat. When I was uh, headed to, on my mission, I was so determined not to live. And when I held the gun initially, I'd placed it up to my head. And a voice spoke to me and said, remove that from your head and place it at your heart. And I argued with this voice and I said, no, because I'm going to complete this mission that I have started with. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I get a vision of what I would look like if I was to some bizarre reason survive yeah. that. And uh, then I got a vision of what I would look like and I felt a compassion for my family. And so I, I listened to the voice and I removed the gun from my head and I placed it down at my heart. You were you pointed to your chest. You, you had it straight going down this way into your heart. I did. Right. I knew where and my here. heart was. And so I took the gun and I aimed it directly for my heart because I was not going to miss. And I wanted that gun to send me into eternity because I was so desperate for my pain and my suffering to end. So you pulled the trigger and there was a loud bang and then what happened? Pat, when I pulled that trigger, I knew my body was dying. I felt the blood rushing through my lungs. Death gripped my body. I became blind. I became death. Uh, deaf, and as my soul left my body, I began traveling faster than the speed of light, and I began mm -hmm. falling and falling and falling, and all of a sudden, this explosion happened on the inside of me. It was as if there was like a sulfuric type acid yeah. burn that consumed me in every way. It was so hideous and terrifying. There are no words to describe the level of pain and the type of burn that I was experiencing. What was it? It was hell, Pat. It was the what the Bible describes hell. as hell. It was the fire of hell. And when I looked around, not only was I in a place of death, but I now had become death. I was no longer... Um, in a place where there was peace. Mm. I was in a place of total torment. Were you terrified? I had become fear. Oh, you become fear. I had become a being of fear. You know, the Bible t describes that death is the absence of God. 
Yeah, yeah. And so in the absence of God, in the absence of anything good, your soul actually transforms into a being of fear, which is the Just opposite of love. So my, my being, my person turned into a being of fear, a being of pain, a being in total isolation. You weren't you, you were anybody else around you. Pat, I could look out and I could see thousands, millions of people you that were all around me but I was unable to communicate with them. Was it like a lake? Was it molten? It was fire? like a, I don't know that it was like a, a lake. There was a, it, it's hard to, um, to describe. I guess you, you could say it was like, it was a huge sea of people. Yes, and was, there were many, many chambers that were all around me. And all of the people that were there were in the same formless being, mm -hmm. screaming out in agony, in total terror, in a hideous scream. Whew. Then there was no end to it, Pat. There are no words to describe how horrific this was. They were screaming in agony. They were Cussing. screaming in agony. And because they had become total beings of yeah, death. Yeah, yeah. And that's hard for the, the physical mind to understand those things. But I, when I would look at it, I remember looking at an individual particularly, and they were as close to me as, as you are. And when I saw them, Pat, I knew everything about them. I knew every sin they had committed. I knew my knowledge about their life was completely full. Uh -huh. I knew everything they had done wrong. I knew their thoughts. I knew their emotions. I knew the will. I knew Everything I could think upon, my wisdom was in its fullness. It was like a Harvard degree instantly, yeah, you know, yeah. but it didn't matter. It, it didn't matter. In that hideous state of a burning torment, the only knowledge that mattered was that Jesus Christ was Lord. And here I am in this state of, of agony, indescribable agony, and the only thing that mattered was that I never surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Was this like regret in your mind as part of that fear? Absolutely the regret. regret there did. was so much regret and, yeah. and shame and guilt that I had believed a lie and that I had believed the deceit. And when I looked out across the, the, the lake, the, across the, the heavens, I could see the entire universe, Pat. And it was like the earth was magnified mm -hmm. and there was a mutual, feeling a mutual understanding of everyone, the thousands and millions of people that were there with me, that we did not want anyone to go where we were. Yeah. We wanted people to go back to earth and warn everyone, don't believe the lie. Do not be deceived by your enemy. Do not come here. Is there anything in your mind prior to this that ever could have seen anything as horrible as that? No, no. Never. And now I read the Bible and I see the Bible, how it describes hell. Yeah. And I, I, it, look at my experience, and there are no words to describe what I experienced, Pat. Was there any end to it for these people? No, there was no end. No and end? No end. And you could look across the Gulf expanse, uh -huh. and you could see heaven. You could see the peace, the joy, the love, the, the wholeness. And you knew you were never going to experience that because time does not exist in eternity. Time does okay. not exist at all. And so you know you are there forever with no relief. The burn will never stop. The screaming will never stop. And the only thing you can do is hope that no one else will yeah. come where you are. That's the most horrible prospect when you think of it. I mean, a human mind can't conceive of anything as absolutely awful as that. You cannot. The human mind cannot, in our physical state, cannot understand spiritual things mm. at all. But you know, Pat, what is so amazing is God's love was so incredible that before I actually um, I shot myself, yeah. I cried out to God to forgive me. And, and in that cry of desperation of forgiveness, God heard me and he is so faithful to his word and to his promise that in my screaming and in my agony and in the revelation of what I experienced, God came down from heaven mm -hmm. and this hand scooped me up, Pat, and picked me up. And I realized I was not in hell because I shot myself. Because no act can take you to hell as if no act can take you to heaven. Mm -hmm. We are saved by faith. Yeah, okay. And so I realized that I wasn't there by my actions. I was there because I didn't receive Jesus as my Lord. And so when this hand picked me up and took me over the vast expanse, took me over that gulf fix, 
and it's huge. But to God, it's just like a simple. Well, that's a what Jesus said line. in the parable. There's a great gulf between us fixed. Yes. And there was a great gulf. A great gulf, <clears throat> and it was of nothingness. Yeah. Dark, just nothingness. And when I went over that, and I entered into God's presence. Yeah. Pat, now you can't describe God's presence either, mm -hmm. but it was love. And I had now left a place of death and torment and darkness. And now I had entered into a place of love and light. Mm -hmm. And I experienced God's wholeness. I experienced His, His grace and His mercy. And there was unity with Christ that is indescribable. My pain was gone, my torment was gone, and I was in this presence of total wholeness. And you could see the, the lights, the beauty of the stones and the lights reflecting in heaven. And the very sight of them was rejuvenate, rejuvenating and just energizing. And they it was were magnificent. communicating with each other. The people were talking. Oh, know, yes, they were, all, they were all communicating. However, I was restricted. You were. I was not allowed to take part in any of that. Although I knew that was going on and although I saw those things, I was not allowed to take part of that or to see many things in detail. Mm -hmm. There was many things understood and the knowledge was free and wisdom was free. And so as I traveled over the heavens and I was cleansed of, of my sin and I came back and, you know, there are in the spiritual world, you're not confound to the restrictions of the physical world. Mm -hmm. And so I came right back into the roof of my home and the, they laid my body, the vessel of God laid my body back, my soul back into my body. And when he did that, I instantly could see and hear again. And I knew at that moment that I was surrendering to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I knew that whatever I was facing, the stigma of suicide, mm -hmm. the stigma of, of everything that I had to face, was it going to be okay? Would you come back in? Was it an operating room? You came back into your home? No, I came back into my home. You did? I came back into my home because when I had gone in there, I was isolated. Nobody knew uh -huh. that I had gone in there uh, alone. So I don't know how long exactly I was um, out of my body. But when I had come back, that was when I had called for my mother to come and help me. And that was when she called the ambulance. But when the ambulance got there, they even asked my mom, are you going to even bother to take her to the emergency room because I was gray. I had the pallor of death on me. Mm -hmm. And they thought that I was fading into death, but what they didn't realize is I had you already even, been yeah, dead yeah. and had just come back. And so within a matter of a few hours, Pat, I had gone from, are you going to bother to take her to the hospital? Mm -hmm. They did their work on me in, in the emergency room. Then they took me into ICU. And by the time they got me to ICU, they're like, there's nothing wrong with her. And they put mm -hmm. me into a regular room. My, my recovery was just miraculous. Well, did you hit the heart? I mean, did your bullet hit the heart? You I missed my heart? heart by less than a fourth of an inch. And I understand with a 38 caliber gun that that should have just shattered oh, my, my heart completely. Well, according to your book, the, the attendants, and when you were lying there, they weren't too complimentary. They were, they were complimentary, a little suggestive. They, <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> they were, it was quite humiliating. Here I was going through a situation that is humiliating in itself, yeah. you know, being in a, a state of, of emotional just despair. And then I had gone in there and, and the emergency crew were just, you know, making sexual innuendos and just, you know, having fun. And it, to them, it was just work. You know, they were just working. Uh, Did they know you were alive and hearing all this? Oh, they, I was very coherent. I mean, they were looking at me at a, for a response. Yeah. And uh, my response was just, you know, I kind of smiled like, I can't believe you're saying this. You know, but good that was grace. part of, God used that, Pat. He works all things for our good. Sure. And he used that to show me, Tamara, you have got to not be afraid of people. Mm -hmm. There is only one fear you should have, and that is a reverent fear for me. And, and this you is, you were 15 years old. I was 15 years old. What's happened since? You know, it's amazing. You know, you hear testimonies of how God just completely delivers you emotionally. That didn't happen with me, Pat. Mm -hmm. Although when I came back, God <clears throat> healed me mm -hmm. um, of hopelessness. But he did not deliver me emotionally instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And I began my journey. And on this journey... Uh, it has been a wonderful journey. God has begun to teach me how to take the promises of His Word yeah. and apply them to my mind and apply them to my emotions. So God has, through a process, completely delivered me 
and, and made me whole where I am no longer um, emotionally distressed or, mm -hmm. or depressed or sad or lonely or rejected. Do other people buy this when you tell them? What is your family, your parents, what do they think? Did you tell them where you'd been? You know, initially I did not tell them, Pat, because I was, it scared me. Yeah. And I know that the stigma when people commit suicide, it's, mm. you know, you're wanting attention and we're going to, okay. You know, and I didn't want people to think that I wanted attention. I wanted people to know what I had to say was the truth because mm -hmm. I was so afraid of what people thought about me. I didn't tell anybody. For two years, I kept this secret to myself. And when I was ready to come and tell people, when I became saved, I started going to church, I started studying God's Word, yeah. I started on my journey of learning how to become free and how to apply the cross to my life. Yeah. But I made a lot of mistakes. And I would still fall back and I would drink and I would party with my friends because I needed these friends, I thought. Mm, okay. And God showed me different. And so when I came out and began to tell my story, people were like, okay, if you're really telling the truth, then why did you go back and do these things? And it's a perfect opportunity for me to tell them, when our soul is in our body, mm -hmm. we are in a war, a war for our soul. Right. And I am having to learn how to crucify my flesh mm -hmm. and live after the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And I have gone on that journey. And so now, Pat, people, when I share my testimony, we see people saved and delivered and, and restored and, and made whole. And that same love that God has given me, I'm seeing Him manifest in the lives of others. And it's just amazing. Well, Tamara, this book is tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called Delivered. Tamara LaRue, what a story. And uh, that journey from heaven or hell to heaven, not heaven to hell, heaven, hell to heaven. Yeah. Tamara, God bless you. This is great. Oh, thank you so much. God has we, been, we serve a mighty God. We do indeed. And you know, Pat, I do, I want to say one thing. If, if you are believing anything other than the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are believing a lie. Because the gospel is the truth. It is the only truth. You cannot mm -hmm. add to it, nor can you take away and from the gospel of Jesus. You've been there. And I've been there. Tamara, God bless you. Thank you thank so you much. So much. Tamara LaRue, ladies and gentlemen, a whole week. We're talking about life beyond the grave. People who've been there, they've seen it. Listen to what they say.